is what happened with Soviet Jewry. And the worst of their crimes, the worst of their crimes, Jewish leaders are responsible for the spiritual holocaust that is taking place each and every day in this country. The destruction of Jewish youth, assimilation into marriage, and just plain alienation. You hear about Jews, Jews for Jesus and Jews for Trotsky and Jews. That's not the biggest problem. The greatest Jewish youth movement in this country is Jews for nothing. And in great measure, it's because of those Jewish leaders who for decades, for decades, ran around this country with a huge pot. It was called the melting pot. And, and they used to beat it daily and cry out the 11th commandment, thou shalt melt. Thou shalt melt. How we were told to melt. Send your children to public school. Public school, it's important that they go to public school so that they meet all kinds. And so they went to public school, made all kinds, and when they brought them home, the parents said, Give up, where did you meet her? <laughs> what did we expect the Jewish youngster to meet in public school? A chassid? <laughs> For decades, the federations did not give a penny to the one thing that would have saved Jewish youth, the Jewish day school. For decades, because the Jewish day school was anathema to these people who wanted to assimilate and join the local country club. That was the tragedy. Our children are victims. You might see Jews saying, lousy kids, they don't want to be Jewish. They are victims, they are victims. And we blame the kids. Think of the kids. Bern, Bernie is sent to, uh, to Berkeley or to Austin or to Madison. He goes and he comes home. Bernie lives on the island, the island. Jews tend to live in places that start with a, with a definite article, the island. On, on the west coast they live in the valley and they pray at the temple with the rabbi so Bernie comes home to the island and then he brings home with him Bridget good good looking shiksa not only good looking smart not only smart but nice you don't you don't have to be Jewish to be nice I'm uh, I, I I hate to break this news to you <laughs> So he brings home this good-looking, smart, nice chick, and he says, Father, Mother, we're getting married. And at that point, we suddenly see the resurrection of the Jewish dead. The, the father hasn't observed Sabbath in 40 years. His closest brush with kosher food is a Sunday bagel. <laughs> and he suddenly shrieks, but Bernie, she isn't Jewish. And Bernie says, how about that? How about that? She isn't Jewish. I hadn't even realized that until this moment. And his mother shrieks and says, but Bernie, you're a Jew. You're a Jew. And Bernie comes back at her with all the agony of 20 years as he says, why should I be a Jew? I want to be a human being. Why should I be a Jew? Now that is a question that in 25,000 years or more his parents could not answer. Bernie's parents are not Jewish out of any logic. They're emotional. They were born Jewish and don't have the, the courage not to be Jewish. Bernie is more honest. And so he asks a very good question. Why be Jewish? His parents don't, don't know. They don't know. Because his parents are Jewish emotionally. They had... Uh, they remember Bobby. They remember Zaidi. They remember Chulent. Bernie would know Chulin from China. Half of the people here wouldn't do this. You can't pass on an emotion to someone who has never felt it. So he wants a logical answer because Bernie's logical. He's a sophomore. <laughs> 
So the parents have no answer. So what do they do? They send him to the, rab the rabbi. Definite article. Now this rabbi is rabbi at the temple, and he is one of the great, great speakers of our time. Just the previous week he gave one of, one of the great sermons of the uh, decade, if not the century, in which he proved conclusively, beyond the shadow of a doubt, that the Bible is a product of, of myths from Sumer and, and Babylon. I tell you, this, this is a, I mean, he's worth every penny that he makes of his $125,000 salary, not counting weddings, funerals, and veilings, cash. <laughs> Furthermore, the rabbi hates racism with every pore in his body, every South African ra racer, he hates racism. So now he has to tell Bernie why he shouldn't marry a good-looking, smart, nice shiksa just because she's a shiksa. What can this, this loser say? What can this bankrupt thing say? What can he whine? So he says, Bernie, to be Jewish is, is ethical. <laughs> Catholics can't be ethical. Protestants can't be ethical. Buddhists can't be ethical. Woody Allen can't be ethical. <laughs> Everybody is ethical, ask them. You don't have to be Jewish to be ethical. In fact, if I had a dollar for every Jew who was not ethical, I might not be Rothschild, but I'd be comfortable. <laughs> now, Bernie is no, is no fool. He knows that that's nonsense. He knows that anybody can be ethical or not. So, of course, he walks away in the noonday sun with is Bridget. That's the tragedy. That's the tragedy. Our Jewish leaders destroyed us in the in the past and are destroying us today. Both here and in Israel. And in Tafada, two we are going into the sec the, the, the end of the second year. Two years of the Intifada. It's like hell. The same army, which in 1967, in six days, smashed four armies, four Arab nations, can't in two years put down rioting by women and children. Of course they can put them down, of course they can, but... Their hands are tied politically. <coughs> I served in, in, in the army for 13 years. I know the orders. The insane, helm-like orders. If you're attacked by a stone-throwing mob, the orders are, you must first warn them. In Arabic, stand back. If, you're cap if they do not and you're still capable, your next step is to shoot in the air. If they are still coming at, at you and you are still capable, you may then shoot one of them in one foot. Those are the orders. And then if you're still alive, you may shoot freely. I put it to you that that is insanity. The Intifada started when? You think it started in December of 87? No. In 1920, Yitzhak Messner, did anybody ever hear of Yitzhak Messner? No. Was murdered by Arabs in Jerusalem. And in 1929, in one day, 67 Jews were massacred in Hebron in one day. One of them was the baker Noah Immerman, whose name is not known to Woody Allen or Richard Dreyfus or Rabbi Axelrod. Noah Immerman was killed by having his head thrust into his oven and he was burned alive. In 1929, you know what was bothering the Arabs in 1929? The occupied lands of 1967. 
Nachman Segel was holding his three-year-old child when they, when they burst in. The Arabs cut his hand through with a, an axe, killing the child. They ripped his intestines to pieces and raped his wife. That was in 1929. You know what was bothering them, them then? The occupied lands of 1967. If only we would have given them back the occupied lands of 1967, 1929 would have never happened. In 1983, a 15-year-old youngster named Danny Katz of Haifa was sent, went out of his home to play tennis. He came from a wealthy family near Carmel. He left his family. They're no longer leftists, but for all the tragic reasons that we'll see. Two Arabs were working two Israeli Arabs working in the supermarket near his home, kidnapped him, raped him, and murdered him. Israeli Arabs, because they're loyal. Hundreds of Jews have been murdered before the Intifada of 1987. and the Jewish leftists and the liberals and the axle rods and the fines and all of those. <coughs> we are to blame. Michael Lerner of Tikkun Magazine publishes an al for Yom Kippur that the Jew should rise up and beat his breast because of how we oppress the Palestinian. He is a diseased mind. A diseased mind. He suffers, he is in a terminal stage of that specific form of Jewish AIDS called guilt. No one suffers from guilt the way Jews. We feel guilty about everything. We have a need to feel guilty. For 2,000 years we were losers we don't know how to win. We feel guilty about winning. We are comfortable losing. We are comfortable dying. We don't know how to live. I love winning. Winning is so much better than losing. I love to live. We've died so much and so often. Where is it a mitzvah to die? Where does it say it's a mitzvah to die? And what in the world and how in the world can we possibly explain that incredible statement by Golda Meir after the 73 war. I can forgive the Egyptians for killing our boys, but I cannot forgive them for making us kill, kill theirs. That is a sickness. When my son was in Lebanon during the uh, war, in 82, in, he, was, he was there, <laughs> artillery. They were given orders that if a PLO position is in, is in a village which is being attacked by infantry, that they are not allowed to give the infantry fire cover lest they kill civilians. I want to tell you that that is a criminal order. When my son goes to fight, I want to know that his commanding officer cares more for him than for Arab civilians because all the Arabs in Lebanon aren't worth to me the life of one Jewish soldier. <laughs> they tried to wipe us out in 1920 and 29 in 1936 to 1938, 510 Jews were massacred in an intifada that lasted for three years then. 
They don't want the lands of 67 because who do you think?